wonderful evening of science and blasphemy. My name is Robin Blumner. I'm the CEO of the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science. I'm and I don't know this for sure, but my guess is this is the smartest gathering in Portland tonight. <laughs> so just quick housekeeping. I'm going to tell you how the evening's going to progress. We will have a very interesting conversation between our two principals for about 45 minutes, maybe an hour. Then it's your turn. And we will have roaming, roving microphones. Usually we do standing mics, but because of um, fire code, we couldn't do that here. So we will have roving microphones. There will be two in the auditorium. I will be holding one. There will be one in the first balcony, and there will be one in the second balcony. So make your make your hand clear that you want to ask a question, and we'll try to be egalitarian about where, where they come from. So it, it, that'll be about a half hour. Then after that, for those of you who have brought books or who would like to purchase a book, the orchestra-level le lobby has a bookstore set up for you to get a book, and then we will have a table where both Richard and Peter will be sitting and signing books well into the evening. So that's how tonight will go. And now on to the main event. Um, I'd like to introduce Professor Peter Bogosian, a professor at Portland State University who wrote the wonderful book, A Manual for Creating Atheists. And a man, yes, and a man who, of course, for everyone here needs no introduction the amazing Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks for your support of reason and rationality and making our communities more sane. It's, it's wonderful to see so many people here on a, in a packed house. It's just absolutely fantastic. It's thrilling to me. So thank you, everyone. And we have some luminaries in the audience. Uh, Dr. Lawrence Krauss is here somewhere. Or... Thank you for coming. So, let's get right into it. Given the vastness of the universe, I've often wondered why we've uncovered no evidence of alien life. Nothing. No signals, no crafts, no probes. I think it, it was Fermi who said, where are they? He said, where is everybody? Yeah. And his colleagues, being very bright and knowing his mind, knew exactly what he meant. He didn't need to tell them what he meant, which is, why haven't they got in touch with us? Right. The reason why one is inclined to believe that there is life elsewhere in the universe is a stati statistical reason. The number of stars and presumably planets, more than presumably planets, uh, is very, very large indeed, 10 to the 22 on current estimates. But the other side of that estimate is that because the numbers are so large, and that's why we believe there's, there's life elsewhere, it's likely to be very, very spaced out. I mean, it could be that there are as few as a billion other life forms elsewhere in the universe. That's very, very, very few indeed compared to 10 to the 22. And if that were the case, then we would expect that they would be so spaced out, these islands of life, celestial Polynesia, hmm. with 
no possibility of canoes between them. Uh, that it, it's not at all surprising that we've never been visited. If we ever are visited, it certainly will not be visited in the form of physical bodies. It will be visited in the form of radio waves uh, because radio waves travel outwards in all directions at the speed of light, uh, whereas physical bodies travel in only one direction. But, okay, so, but, but why haven't we seen... I mean, we've seen nothing. We've seen no probes, like von Neumann probes. We've seen, we've seen no, no... Shouldn't we have seen something? No. No, I mean, not, not if there's only a billion of them. <laughs> okay, so if there are a billion of them, and if they colonized, but, but, but been, now that I think of it, why, why would they colonize? Maybe coloni colonization well, is like a human idea. I, I wouldn't expect them to colonize. I mean, as I say, what, what, what I might expect, I mean, at any time, we might pick up a, a radio signal. Uh, and... I think it's a worthwhile enterprise, SETI, the, the Search for Extraterrestrial right. Intelligence uh, run by Jill Tata, is a worthwhile enterprise. It might pick up something at any, at any time. So far it hasn't. There are all sorts of possible reasons why, why that might not be. I mean, it takes, it takes a lot. It's taken us four billion years to reach the point of radio technology where we'd be capable of sending a radio signal out there. Um, some people have suggested that the interval between developing radio technology and developing the technology to destroy oneself right. uh, is very short. <laughs> so there may be civilizations winking into existence all over the place and then promptly going out again right. um, uh, before, that. before they've had a chance to send their, their signals. If we ever do get a signal, uh, we won't, it, there'll be not much point in replying because our reply would right. take millions of years probably. To, to reach, or thousands of years anyway. So two ideas that, that have kind of struck me as interesting, I don't know how much weight I'd give them. One is that our model of the universe is just not correct. Maybe we're alone and there's something that we haven't, a friend of mine said to me, we've had a, a Darwin of biology, but we've had no Darwin of cosmology. In other words, we've had nobody to give us a kind of Copernican revolution in our thought to show us that the model of the universe we have is not correct and we're alone. Now, that could be, that obviously is a wild speculation, but it's, I think it was Carl Sagan who said, someone's got to be the first, so we could be the first. We could be the first. Give, given that we've, had, uh, we've taken four billion years and the universe is 13 point something, right. Billion years. Not all of that's been available for de development of life, but uh, it is possible that there's been a, another complete cycle before we even started. Uh, so I, d I don't know. I mean, I, I think it's um, uh, rather unlikely that we're the first, but, but, but we could be the first. I rather treasure Carl Sagan's answer to the question, do you believe that there is life elsewhere? He said, I don't know. So his question oppressed him and said, yes, but what's your gut feeling? Yeah. He said, I try not to think with my gut. <laughs> <laughs> a life lesson, a life lesson. So this is a related question. I've divided these up into biology and religion and a few other categories. Is evolution so integral to biology that the presence of life must imply an evolutionary process? In other words, are there any conditions under which life could have arisen in the universe absent evolution. My literary agent, John Brockman, who is a great proselytizer for science, has an annual question every Christmas. He asks his address book, which is the finest address book in America, for uh, a, a, an answer to a question. And one year the question was, what do you believe but cannot prove? And Lots of people gave different answers. My, my answer was precisely, uh, I believe but cannot prove that wherever there's life in the universe, it is Darwinian life. Hmm. Um, I, <laughs> I'm glad well, that makes you happy. <laughs> in the broad sense, it would be something, some kind of natural selection. Uh, I think it probably needs to have a digital genetics, such as we've got here, because digital is necessary, I think, for the, for the high fidelity which Darwinism requires. Uh, it might not be a um, linear, um, one-dimensional 
digital stream like we've got. It could be a two-dimensional matrix or something of that sort. There could be major differences, and obviously there could be very major differences in the form that the life takes. But I would put my shirt on, I would stick my neck out for the view that it will be some kind of Darwinian life. I've looked at all the alternatives that have ever been suggested, and there's really only one, which is Lamarckism. And that doesn't Which is work. what I missed that, which is what? L Lamarckism. Oh, Lamarckism, okay. Um, L Lamarckism, th this was a view of the French biologist um, Lamarck, who preceded da Darwin by about um, 30, 40 years. Um, the combination of the principle of use and disuse, the more you use a bit of your body, the bigger it gets or the stronger it gets, and inheritance of acquired characteristics. So the classic example is the blacksmith's arms. The more the blacksmith uses his arms, the bigger the muscles get. And uh, the Lamarckian idea is that then he passes on his big muscular arms to his children. Hmm. Um, and it has been said by various biologists that there's nothing wrong with the Lamarckian theory except it isn't true. <laughs> and, uh, I, I think there's a lot wrong with it. I think that even if it were true, even if it were true that, uh, inherit, that the acquired characteristics were in, inherited, I don't believe it's a big enough theory to account for the complexity of life. It's all very well for the blacksmith's arms, but that's just, it's just one of very few things that it'll work for. It won't work for eyes. It won't work for ears. Eyes don't get better the more you use them. There's no reason why they should. Um, Whereas natural selection picks up in even the slightest improvements. It doesn't matter how deeply buried they are within the body, within the internal biochemistry of the cell, any slight improvement. As Darwin said, nature is daily and hourly scrutinizing. Because anything that changes the probability of survival, however slightly, how, in however small a way, will be picked up by natural selection because the numbers are so vast and the, the large numbers of population and the genes that are being selected get the opportunity to be favored again and again through many generations. So, so that would not be a property of carbon-based life. I mean, if it were possible that there were non-carbon-based life, it would be subject to the same problem. Yeah, I mean, it's a separate question whether you can imagine life that's not carbon-based. I asked Harry Croto, the uh, Nobel Prize-winning chemist, um, whether he thought that there was any possibility of non-carbon-based life. And he absolutely ruled it out. He said, it's really? got to be carbon. But, but even if it was, even if there was non-carbon-based life, my shirt is on it being Darwinian, no, nevertheless. What, what possible reason, given that he has no evidence, what, what is his reason for the... Knowledge of chemistry. But, um, ca carbon has properties which enable it to form these great big molecules uh, of, 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 of huge complexity. Um, I think the nearest possible competitor would be silicon, but, but he, was, he didn't think silicon could do it. I, I actually like the idea of commissioning chemists to think about alternative hmm. lives. I mean, and I don't think they do enough of that. Yeah, I, I've often wondered if, if, so if you take kind of the ghost out of the machine and, and you, you look at something just in terms of a, a biological process and, and a cultural process, then you have, which is one of the big topics now, free will. But I am not a chemist, and it would seem that sentience could certainly be a... I don't see... Maybe I don't know enough about chemistry, but it would seem that sentience could be a property of non-carbon-based life forms. Oh, yes. Uh, sentience could be a property of silicon-based yeah. life forms, man-made ones. Right. Uh, I mean, it will be. Right. I believe, yeah. uh, but uh, there has to be a carbon, I think Harry Crota would say, there would have to be a carbon-based life form to manufacture the, uh, the silicon-based, um, would you call it life? Yes, you probably would call it life, but mm. I mean, it would be, it, it, it would need to have evolved by natural selection in the first place, and then maybe designed by intelligent design, by intelligent carbon-based life forms. Mm. Which kind of relates, in a sense, to our earlier question, because there could be some great filter or something, but uh, a civilization could have created artificially intelligent entities, and again, we still haven't seen any evidence of those. I'm hoping, I'm hoping that that's on my bucket list. I mean, I'm, I, my bet would be on that too. I think, I think that, that um, com computer life will 
achieve sentience and um, may be a great improvement on us. <laughs> we have technologies now that enable people to live to the age of reproduction where they otherwise might not have. Does this have any effect on human evolution? For example, have medical advancements slowed down the evolutionary process of natural selection? Or what is the best way to conceptualize the, in, the intervention of culture and technological advances on the process of evolution? Historically, before technology and culture arose, uh, natural selection favored the ability to survive and the ability to reproduce, survival being a prerequisite to reproduction. So fitness, which has become a biological technical term, once upon a time meant pretty much what it means in ordinary language. Um, ability to run fast, keen sense organs, um, ability to survive. And the natural selection arose because a lot of individuals failed to reproduce because they died. Right. Uh, nowadays, if you fail to reproduce, it's probably not because you've died. Uh, <laughs> it's probably because you don't want to reproduce, uh, or, uh, yes, I mean, that's pretty much what, what, what it would be. <laughs> so, um, if there is, I mean, there, there's still, some people do still die young, and some people do some people might have reproduced if they hadn't already died. That, that does happen. But the main cutting edge of natural selection of that kind has been blunted, at very least. Nowadays, the great um, variation in whether you reproduce or not is whether you want to. And so if there is, uh, or, or if you're incompetent in the use of contraception, I suppose. <laughs> uh, um, so if, if there is any, ver any genetic variance in desire to reproduce or competence in reproducing, um, then by definition we have natural selection. So uh, it's a separate question and a very big question whether there actually is a genetic component. If you actually divide uh, any set of people like the people in this room into those who have lots of children and those who have none, and then try to see whether there's any genetic correlation with, with those who have a lot of children and those who don't. If there is, then by definition we have natural selection. Whether that will give rise to an evolutionary change depends yeah. upon how long that difference is sustained. So if the difference between those who have lots of children and those who don't was due to, say, their religion, then it'll only have evolutionary consequences right. if the religion goes on for tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, and we all obviously hope it won't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, sim and similarly, if, if there's any genetic variance in fumbling incompetence at the use of contraception, um, then by definition we have natural selection in favour of fumbling incompetence. Um, <laughs> But again, it's unlikely to give rise to any evolutionary change right. unless what it takes to be incompetent in 10,000 years is genetically the same as it is now. And again, that's unlikely. Right. That was a great answer. <laughs> All right, so we've, uh, that was biology. We've exhausted the categories. Now on to one of our favorite topics, religion. <laughs> This is, a, this is a good audience. <clears throat> I'm frequently asked, what's the harm with moderate religious belief? If people aren't hurting anyone, who cares if they believe in a talking snake? My answer to this question in brief has been that it's important to see reality for what it is because then we could make better decisions. If our starting assumptions about the world are incorrect, then we make choices that we think leads to our well-being, but does not. Yet no matter how many times I've answered this question, it keeps popping up. Well, yeah. How have you addressed it, and what might be a better answer? Well, of course, I, I agree with that, with, you, with your answer. I mean, that, that I'm, I'm sure it is right. But it doesn't really strike home to me okay. uh, in, in a way that uh, I just love truth. I mean, I... It, to, to, to me, if somebody believes in a talking snake, it's all very well saying they're not doing any harm. And, but 
they're doing themselves harm, they're doing their children harm, because they're missing so much. Mm. I mean, the, the truth that we now know in the, well, I was going to say the 21st century, but I, you could go back to the 19th century. Um, the truth that we now know about life, why we exist, why we're here, why all life is here, the truth that physicists are now telling us about why the cosmos is here, why, why well, everything is here, it's so astoundingly marvellous that for anybody to go to their grave believing in talking snakes and Adam and Eve and pettifogging little things like that is just a tragedy. Mm. And as a lifelong professional educator, I can't bear the thought of it. And so um, I, I think I sort of just go further than you can. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think... I think it's a type of injustice towards oneself. Yes. And, and I think, and you've written about this extensively, when you teach that to children, it's basically a form of child abuse. Well, I, I, I think that some people find that too strong a statement, and so I could, I could I say don't. that what... Well, I'm glad to, he I'm glad to hear that. Um, uh, what, what it, what, what's not too strong is to say that teaching children that they'll roast in hell if they sin or if they don't believe in God. I mean, right. that really is child abuse. Right. Uh, I, I don't see how anybody could deny that. But I mean, it's, it's, I think it's a mild form of, of child abuse to deprive a child of the fullest education that the century in which the child is born can offer. Right. On what basis do we look at human history and think we'd be better off without religion? I'm thinking of the Soviet Union. My friend Chris Matheson, who's here, gave me this question tonight. I'm thinking of the Soviet Union. Do we have any reason to think that societies would be better off without religion? Yes. <laughs> um, um, I mean, the Soviet Union w was without religion of the kind that people think of as religion. It had a different religion, the religion of Stalinism. Um, I mean, Stalin was worshipped as a demigod mm. uh, in the same kind of way as Roman emperors were worshipped as gods. Both Stalin and Hitler had what are more or less indistinguishable from prayers offered to them. Uh, I think people actually used to kneel down right. to say their prayers to Stalin. Uh, in Hitler's Germany, uh, before meals, a grace was said. It was, it was sort of, you know, we, we thank the Adolf Hitler for, for, for this food that's on our table kind of thing. Um, so uh, it, I don't think it's an accurate use of language to say that the Soviet Union was free of religion. It was a new religion yeah. of its own. Um, I think that it's uh, absolutely beyond question that society would be better in all ways without, without religion. I long for the day. Yeah. <laughs> I think, I think it, it relates back to the previous question in that if, this, if your starting premise is incorrect, somebody rose from a tomb, I don't know, I'm thinking about the talking snake thing again, but if, if, you're, if your starting premise is correct, then your belief structure will be populated with, you, you'll kind of run down a rabbit hole. You'll be populated with all these things for which you have no evidence because the root belief that you have is out of alignment with reality. And so I've often wondered, you know, how do we help people bring their beliefs back in alignment with reality? And, and I think, of course, teaching evolution is important, but how do we help people to trust the sciences. How do we, we, we take the value of belief revision? And how do we take certain, again, it's, it's the, not just the public understanding of science, I think, but it's that we have to help people to value the right things. Truth. Yes. Uh, among them. Evidence. Chief among them. Uh, evidence, I mean, ev absolutely. Evidence is the only reason to believe anything. Right. Uh, and and I, I mean, I, I don't know what where you go beyond just simply asserting that. It seems mm. to me obvious, but but um, not everybody takes but it as obvious. It hasn't worked too well. Though. I like I, I liked your your rabbit hole thing because um, uh, and, and you actually mentioned 
um, Jesus rising from the dead because I, I have been quite startled talking to so-called sophisticated theologians. Right. I mean, Jerry we, Coyne's I'm, term. I'm used to the I'm used to the idea that uh, that fundamentalists believe all sorts of nonsense, but then people will say, "Oh, but that, that they're just fundamentalists. You right. need to talk to a bishop or two, and so on." Um, and and I, I've been quite surprised when I have talked to bishops. Not all of them, of course, but but some, including at least one archbishop, to find that they actually do believe Jesus turned water into wine. They actually do believe Jesus walked on water. And when I say, how can you? They say, well, for me, the resurrection of Jesus is beyond question. That, that I absolutely accept. And if Jesus could rise from the dead, then there's no limit to what he could do. <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> And that's their reason for believing that he turned water into wine, uh, despite the fact that the, the evidence for where the scripture comes from is so utterly tenuous. It's kind of a lame party trick, too. Well, I, I must say, Jamie Ian Swiss can do a lot better. Than, right. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it's interesting, that, that idea of a sophisticated theologian, that, and that was what you were accused, people accused you, when you wrote The God Delusion, that, oh, if you only read some absolutely obscure theologian who's nobody who's ever heard of, not even in the deepest of graduate school, if you've only read this, then you would come to a different conclusion. Or if you've only read somebody who spouts off whatever, then you would come to a different conclusion. But that's, that's well, fatuous. That's yes, I mean, uh, um, you just mentioned Jerry Coyne, and can I recommend his book that's just it's come out, um, Fact Versus Faith? Uh, where he does actually, he actually took the trouble, and goodness yeah. me, the, what, a, what a noble effort that was, to, <laughs> to actually go and, and read so-called sophisticated theologians with all their deepities. I think he's kind of recovering now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he took two years of his life to yes, do that. Yes, um, It was a very, very noble effort. Uh, um, <laughs> I think that actually in The God Delusion I uh, discussed all the arguments for the existence of God. What sophisticated theology mostly does is to assume the existence of God right. and then derive all sorts of other things from that. But the actual arguments that they have for the existence of God are not at all sophisticated right. and extremely easy to, to knock down. Yeah, I said to a friend of mine, all theology is just a complicated form of confirmation bias. He said, no, it's not. It's a very simple form of confirmation bias. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I mean, I, I would like to qualify that by saying that plenty of professors of theology are doing very interesting work, but it's not theology. I mean, they're in departments of theology, but they're doing interesting work deciphering the Dead Sea Scrolls, right. uh, comparing manuscripts of Isaiah with each other, and, and so on, and, um, and, and studying biblical history. Just archaeology, dis di discovering whether it's really true that the Israelites were in captivity right. in, in Egypt, which they weren't, by the way. Um, uh, I mean, th that, I think, is a very good thing to be done, and, it, and much of it is done in departments of theology. But those theologians who spend their time arguing about the transubstantiation right. and the Trinity... I mean, uh, they, things, they, I, I don't mean to be rude to them, but they'd be better off looking at a wall. I mean, what a profound waste of your intellectual horsepower. Yes. I mean, you, you would be better off literally attempting to think about nothing than to dig yourself into a cognitive sinkhole. And then they become, right? And then they become convinced that these bizarre speculations are somehow true. I think it was our friend Dan Barker said, theology is the only, is the only subject without an object. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the, the form of reasoning, it, it, it assumes what, what we would think is, is that which has to be proved, and right. it, it, it assumes, and then the kind of reasoning is, um, uh, well, there's a Catholic bit of theology that says something like this, um, there must be a purgatory because, uh, when, because we pray for the souls of, of people in purgatory and hoping that they will go to heaven. If there wasn't a purgatory, there would be no point in our praying. <laughs> and we do pray, therefore there's a purgatory. Right. 
Yeah, and, and it's that kind of, uh, which actually leads us into the next section of the RDFRS. And, okay, so some people feel a sense of hopelessness. They think there's nothing they can do to stem the tide of irrationality. For example, around 45% of Americans are young Earth creationists. In the U.S., that's, yep. In the U.S., the majority of Republicans deny the facts of evolution and refuse to seriously entertain the idea that global warming is anthropogenic, caused by humans. But, but that's absolutely not true. It's not hopeless. Your foundation, the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science, has made and continues to make remarkable achievements in the advancement of reason and the public understanding of science. So can you please tell us about some of the RDFRS's recent accomplishments and going forward, what are the plans? And, oh. and, and so, one more thing, and so we can consider this the public service announcement for the evening. How can, how can people here watching or listening get to be more directly involved with the foundation? The main thing we're trying to do at the moment is the campaign called Openly Secular, and we're doing this in collaboration with other um, secular organizations. Um, this is an attempt, in a way, to take a leaf out of the gay community's book, uh, because it's startling how quickly the gay community has managed to transform itself from being pariahs to being accepted, respected, actually getting married now. Um, And that gives us hope, that gives us encouragement, because it's been so swift, and it's been an exercise in consciousness raising, and a good deal of it has been simply coming out and saying, I'm gay, yeah. and I'm a useful member of society in whatever I happen to be, a taxi driver, or a, a, a waiter, or a doctor, or a lawyer, whatever it is. Um, and you liked me before you knew I was gay. Now that I've come out, I'm the same person. Um, I'm just as likable as I ever was. So all your prejudice, all your bigotry was for nothing. Now, uh, the prejudice and bigotry against atheists in America is even greater, I dare say, than the prejudice against gay people was, certainly more than it is now. Uh, and um, I think we're s down there somewhere with, with, with rapists, aren't we? Yes. Something, something like that. <laughs> um, and this is a most astonishing fact because all that we are is people who hold a different view of the nature of the universe uh, and such things. I mean, this is philosophical differences. No basis for banishing a child from the, from the parental home, which we get constant uh, stories of. We get constant stories of people's marriages breaking up, mm. of people being disowned by their parents, disowned by their children. Um, disowned by their community, ostracized, sacked from their work, all because they just have a different view of what the universe is all about. And this is sheer bigotry, it's mm. sheer prejudice, and it's, it's based upon, uh, I suppose, misunderstanding, it's based upon um, a, a knee-jerk reaction to a word, atheist, uh, and it, it just cannot be allowed to continue. And so what we're trying to do, we're not calling our campaign openly atheist. We, 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 we've chickened out of that in a way. Um, <laughs> we're calling it openly secular. Uh, secular is an easier thing. I mean, actually some religious people, and many religious people right. are secular in the sense that they don't believe that, uh, that religion should be allowed to encroach into politics or the, the way we run our lives. Um, so we are trying to get and succeeding in getting lots and lots of ordinary, nice, decent people, people next door, to do a YouTube video, just a one minute, half a minute YouTube video, um, saying, I am a nurse and I care for people and I do it because I'm altruistic and I'm an, and I'm an atheist or, and I'm openly secular. Uh, and so we get lots of ordinary people doing that. We're posting them on the Openly Secular website. Also getting celebrities, uh, because for one reason or another, people listen to celebrities. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, 
so we get um, comedians and film stars and uh, footballers whom I've never heard of, but other people have. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, it, 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 it's going extremely well. Uh, the, the, the campaign is going very, very well. Uh, and I encourage everybody here to, to stand up and be counted, come out of the closet, proclaim yourself to be openly secular, and get a movement going so we hit a tipping point where floodgates are opened, and it no longer becomes impossible to get elected to the United States Congress unless you lie. <laughs> It, it, ha it has to be statistical nonsense that 535 <coughs> members of Congress, some of them quite intelligent, some of them well-educated, uh, it has to be a nonsense that all 535 of them right. believe in supernatural magic. Right. They're lying. They've got to be lying. Right. <coughs> and I don't think we can blame them for lying. They believe, possibly rightly, that they have to lie in order to get elected. So rather than blame them, let's change the culture so that they no longer have to lie, that they can proudly say that they're secularist or atheist. And if they're more cynically going after votes, they will not only chase after the traditional things they do, like chase after the Irish vote and the Catholic vote and the Polish vote and things, they will chase after the no-religion vote, which is very, very substantial, much more substantial than many people realize, as a recent Pew poll has shown. Right. And there's, when we do the book signing at the end, there's more information that people can get if they want to be more active. And already being here and promoting reason, we've packed the house, you've packed the house, so uh, we, you can be counted and you can have your voice heard. All right, so I'm going to throw some curveball questions at you. I read this, over, this question over, and I'm not really sure I understand my own question, but we'll see. Well, if you don't understand it. <laughs> if a supernatural answer to a question was actually the best answer, what would that entail for science? I think that's a very difficult question. I've only just started realizing that. I don't even know what a supernatural answer see, would even problem. look like. Yeah, that's I don't understand what it would possibly mean. Um, supernatural could very well mean beyond what we at present understand about the natural world. But if you look at the history of science, uh, or just, just about all the major advances, both in science and en engineering actually, would have seemed supernatural to people of a previous century. Clark's third law, uh, mm. anything, any, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So I don't think that a, that a supernatural explanation for anything is actually even coherent. Right? Yeah, that's why I think it's a terrible question. <laughs> because how would you know? There'd just be no way to know that, that it was actually supernatural. There'd be no... Uh, well, right. I mean, what, I, when you see a really good conjurer, I mean, not just the ordinary children's party kind, but right. like Penn and Teller or Darren Brown or yeah. Jamie Ian Swiss. I, I mean, to all intents and purposes, it, it is supernatural. Right. Uh, it's, it's, it, you couldn't really imagine a better demonstration of something right. supernatural, uh, yet we know it isn't, because the honest ones, like the ones I've just mentioned, right. tell you that it's, a, that it's only a trick. Um, so, I don't know, if you... If, I mean, suppose that the that we looked through a telescope and we saw a constellation which was uh, where the stars were, were not just vaguely looking like a, a hunter or a, or a water carrier or something, but were, were actually spelled out right. the name of God in ancient Hebrew or something. Um, what would that tell you? I mean, I, it, I, I'd be inclined to think that some, some not supernatural, but superhuman alien that's Penn and Teller weren't, weren't, weren't um, right. yeah. or, or you, perhaps more probably that I was hallucinating. Yeah, uh, right. So, so because you couldn't rule out alternative explanations, a trickster alien culture, somebody dosed your water with LSD, because you couldn't rule out those things, you couldn't, the default wouldn't be supernatural. 
That's right. Time I mean, travel yes. or whatever. I mean, I think Hume's criterion would be, would be the, right, the right one. All right, so let's put that question yeah. to rest. The second one is somewhat related, but it's more coherent. <laughs> Certain theories, like string theory, have virtually no hard evidence to substantiate their claims. Supernatural claims have no hard evidence to substantiate them either. What's the difference between these claims? I'm not a physicist, and uh, I, I don't, um, I, I'm not really qualified to answer about string theory. Uh, Can I just oh, pause you right there? Yes. That, well, <laughs> that, that was an awesome answer. It was. It was somebody who said, you know, I'm not a physicist. I don't know really ultimately the answer. Maybe we actually we do have someone here who knows the answer to that question, but that was a great answer. And that's the, I think that gets back to the value that we were speaking about. Like how do you help people to value saying, I don't know? How do we create a culture where that's not only acceptable, but where that's almost relished? I, I strongly agree with that. Um, yes. Uh, so, so although I mean I I don't know uh, about string theory, and I don't know. Uh, I mean I I, be I believe you're right when you say that there's no hard evidence for it. Uh, is it possible to say something like that? It or and other things like it have a kind of ring of plausibility, which although there's no actual evidence for them. Um, they help physicists to understand other things, something like that. I mean, I, I don't know whether that, that's a realistic way to, way to put the appeal of string theory. Um, yeah, I think ultimately, and again, I'm, I'm also not a particle physicist or physicist, I, I think ultimately that those are testable claims. I think it was Brian Greene or someone who said that if it turns out to be false, it's a real bummer because it's a waste of a lot of good math. <laughs> Yeah, I, I get that, yeah. yes. All right, so now the fun, fun type questions. If you had a time machine, where and when would you go and what would you do? I think I would go to the origin of language because I'm fascinated by the sophistication of language. Linguists tell us that all human languages that have ever been looked at are equally sophisticated, unlike the scientific cultures that we look around anthropologically around the world, where some, like the American scientific culture, are hugely more sophisticated than the scientific culture of, say, the New Guinea Highlanders. Um, I'm told that is not true of languages, that some of the most, most complicated languages are uh, associated with tribes who have no scientific culture to speak of at all. So language is an astounding phenomenon. Um, it lies behind, I think, much of what separates humans from all other animals. And what, what would you do? Would you just... I would, I would want to know. I would want to see the intermediate stages. I would want to see uh, what language looked like before it developed sophisticated, recursive, self-embedded grammatical structures. The capacity to say things like if so-and-so, then so-and-so. The capacity to, to develop um, uh, mutually embedded prepositional relative clauses, that kind of thing. The capacity to talk about events that are not in the immediate present. The capacity to speculate about the future. The capacity to talk philosophy. Um, the, the, this is something that totally separates the human species from all other apes, all other animals. But surely there must have been an intermediate stage when language consisted, say, only of nouns or something of that sort. But or, you, you wouldn't understand that if you... you well, obviously that. not. I mean, I, you've, you've got to have a babel fish in your ear or something. Yeah, or, right? or, yeah. yeah. I was thinking if... if uh, I was thinking if you had... Well, since the whole question is make-believe anyway, uh, if you had a TARDIS, a time machine... Well, okay, I mean, I, trans, I, mean I, I, could, I could have said I'd like to go back to the time of Jesus, but I don't speak Aramaic. Right. And so, and right. so I mean, that would have to be a certain license in this right. thought experiment. Right. <laughs> 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 the point is very well taken. 
Who wrote these questions? <laughs> Clearly a lot of people love you, but... Uh... <clears throat> no question, just a comment. Next one. Uh, clearly a lot of people love you, but a lot of people don't. <laughs> How do you deal with people hating you? How do you deal with people loving you? Well, how, how I deal with people hating me is I read out the hate mail on... on... <laughs> uh, I think... I think um, Actually, humor is one of the best ways of dealing with anything, mm. and, and mm. so uh, just simply reading out the hate mail in a humorous way, just, just, just as ridicule is one of the best ways of dealing with nonsense. Um, and, uh, is it stressful to you? N no. Uh, no. No. It, it, it is stressful to me to be hated by people that I don't want to be hated by. Mm. Um, but, but fundamentalist Christians, no, I don't find that at all. <laughs> <laughs> How do I deal with people loving me? I, yeah. I, I don't know. I don't. I, um, try me. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's. I, I'm always struck by when when people approach you, the sincerity that they have. You know, the the heart, the genuine, totally authentic, sincere. Thank you. Like you know, you started my life in science. You started me down, you know, thinking about things, reflecting, and it just, it's amazing to me. Well, Peter, you, you were one, one who actually um, alerted me to that in a way because we, you, you shared a table where I was signing books last mm. time I was here. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, I had become sort of in a way used to these very delightful comments like the selfish gene was what turned me into a biologist, that, right. that kind of thing. But you actually wrote them down yeah. uh, and, um, and I think broadcast them in some, some way. And uh, that was a very nice thing to do. And, and uh, we do collect them on richarddawkins.net, our web website. We have a section, is it still called The Good, The Bad and The Ugly? It used to be called that. Um, and, and the, and the good are very, very good indeed. And they, and they often say, they, they're nearly always thanks for books. And what was so striking to me about that is that one person can make a difference. Right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, one person can make a very significant difference in someone's life. There's a young man here who, was, who wrote an introduction to a book. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's Jake. Great. <laughs> That's great. All right. Um, oh, yeah. I loved your last book. I loved your autobiography for part one, but you have a new one, part two, coming about. Could you please tell us a little bit about yes. that? Yes. Um, part one um, is called An Appetite for Wonder, and it covers my childhood uh, up to the age of 35 when I wrote The Selfish Gene. Uh, part two covers the second half of my life, uh, it's called Brief Candle in the Dark. Uh, you will no doubt take the reference to Shakespeare. Out, out, brief candle. Uh, and the reference to Carl Sagan, Science as a Candle in the Dark. So it's a, it's a, it's a, a joining up of Shakespeare and Carl Sagan, which I think is a very happy union. Um, it's not chronological, unlike Volume 1. It's thematic. So there's a chapter on television, there's a chapter on my life as an Oxford uh, professor, there's a chapter on travel, there's there, various other chapters which cut across chronology. Um, and uh, that's about it, really. Um, it, have, you, have you written it yet? Yes, it's finished. Who's, the, who's publishing it? It's being published in September. Uh, in America, it's being published by HarperCollins, and in Britain, by Random House, okay. and in quite a lot of other countries as well, in various different languages. Well, I'm looking forward to reading Thank that. You. Are you thinking of another book after that? Uh, if so, what might that be about? 
or perhaps we'll get some suggestions in the audience for the Q&A. But that's a good idea. Yeah. I, I never think very far ahead. Uh, I live for the moment. And I, so, uh, so I, I don't have any immediate plans, uh, but I, maybe I'll summon up the energy. Okay, what we'll do now is we will, we'd like to take as many questions as possible. So we'll, I'll say, um, what was I supposed to say? This is the first, what was this again? The, the opera? What was this? Orchestra, the orchestra, the opera, I don't know where they came from. The orchestra, level one and level two. So it's very important that everybody, we will pass around a mic, but here is the, this is the most important thing. We would like to get as many questions in as possible. So that means please ask your question and just a question so we can fit everybody in. Try to do that within 10 or 15 seconds so we can go on. And, it, and also, the, maybe the question just can be answered with yes or no. Make it... <laughs> so, right now, the orchestra. Thank you very much for being here, by the way. Um, I had a question for you regarding basing your life or whatever you're doing on faith, and you briefly touched on uh, the importance of not basing your life on a talking snake and how that can do danger. I've been sober now for five years, and my job is to help people get sober, and about 99% of the recovery world is based on 12 steps, which if you know is heavily dominated by God, I base my sobriety on science. Uh, it's a rational recovery. And I try to spread that to people, to attack it rationally. And I get many, many people that come in from 12 Steps and will say, well, what's the problem with me incorporating my God delusion into this? And if you could touch a little bit more on the importance of the solid foundation of not basing that on God and faith, but reason and science, I'd appreciate it. Well, in a way, I suppose I partly answered that in response to uh, Peter's question of uh, what's actually wrong with, mm. with, with religion. I sort of said something about that. Um, I think faith is deeply pernicious because faith is defined as belief without evidence. Uh, and uh, it has, I mean, I, I, I don't particularly want to talk about the, the problem of being, being sober and, and because I don't know anything about that. Um, <laughs> um, but more generally, I think faith is deeply pernicious because it not only is belief without evidence, but it glorifies lack of evidence. It actually says there's something virtuous about lack of evidence. Mm. And that way, not only madness, madness lies, but violence lies. Mm. Because if your faith is sufficiently strong, then you will believe that uh, you are justified in using any means at your disposal in order to uh, propagate your faith. And we see that in the world all the time. It's not a majority, but it doesn't take a majority. Um, it takes a mi minority. There's a very significant minority whose faith is so strong that they think they're justified in killing and dying for it. And that is deeply pernicious. Let's see if we can get f some, someone from level one up there. Hello, Dawkins. Love you, man. You're great. Um, so I was thinking, and uh, I was thinking about the Soviet Union and how they kind of were, you know, outlawing religion to a certain extent, and like how you were saying, you your, know, Remember your question. Go to the yes, question. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Do you think maybe there will be a future where, where the United States might outlaw religion? Maybe? I, I don't think I'd ever be in favor of outlawing any system of thought. I thought thought should be free. Um, I mean, speech should be free, and a fortiori, I thought should, should, be, should be free. So, uh, no, I, would, I, I, I hope not. I hope there'll never be any outlawing. Uh, what I hope is that people will simply come to their senses. Thank you. <laughs> Let's see if we can get someone from level three up there. I'm having a little difficulty seeing, but level three. Hi. Hi, level Hi three. 
Professor Dawkins, thank you for coming to the most godless city in America, according to a recent poll, so thank you. Uh, a slight twist on the previous question, could you predict, in the same way that, let's say, Ray Kurzweil is a uh, futurist, can you predict in, let's say, a thousand years what religion will be in America, in the same way that we would walk through Giza and say, look at those people, they thought Horace brought the sun across in a canoe. Is When we walk through a relic of a church downtown here, would we find something very similar? In, in general, I feel that um, prediction is a mug's game. But in this case, you've given me a thousand years. Could I predict that there won't be any more religion? Yes. A, a thousand years is a, is a decent in, interval of time. Let's, let's take another one from level three up there. How, how are you doing up there, level three? Hi, this is exciting. Um, I was just wondering what advice you have for young atheists like me who live in a community where you're just kind of blind to the news because you're so busy LOLing and YOLOing. I, I don't know, who, who heard that? I, 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 I didn't understand a single word of that. Okay, we're moving. Sorry, I mean, we, we, we just didn't, didn't hear it clearly. So what, what, what's the, what was the question? Oh, sorry. I, I didn't, was that English? I, I'm not, <laughs> no, I'm not making funny. I really, so slow it, the cadence down a little bit. Uh, it wasn't abbreviations. Come on, please. Sorry, I was just wondering what advice you have for young atheists like me who live in a community that's kind of blind to problems because we're too busy on our phones. Ah, excellent. Too we busy. got that. We're too, we're They're too busy on their phones. Oh, right, yes. Yeah. Um. And what advice for young atheists? Well, we're, we're, the Openly Secular campaign is trying to encourage you to come out, so come out on your phone. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's, let's go to level, level one here. Level one. Who has the mic on level one? Hi there. Uh, what do where, we do about the... Where are you? Oh, okay. Hi, hi. Sorry. Level one, go for it. <laughs> okay. What do we do about the fascinating paradox, practically speaking, that the religious impulse is itself actually a product of evolution? Well, everything is in one sense, uh, but I would translate that as saying that what is a product of evolution is a psychological, well, perhaps several psychological predispositions which manifest themselves as religion under the right cultural conditions. So, I, although I think it's pretty clear that in some sense natural selection has favored religion, it probably hasn't favored religion per se, it's probably favored psychological predispositions such as a tendency to obey authority, a tendency to believe your parents and grandparents and tribal elders. And once you put it that way, once you rephrase it that way, you then realize that there are perfectly good Darwinian reasons why it might be beneficial to believe what your parents and grandparents and tribal elders tell you, especially if you're a child, because children are vulnerable, children are in danger in the wild from being eaten by leopards and things like that. And so rather than cultivate a skeptical, critical frame of mind, testing everything by evidence, simply believing what your parents tell you uh, could very well be a good survival strategy. The problem with that is that uh, but that by v very definition, the rule of thumb that's built into the brain by natural selection that says believe what your parents and grandparents tell you cannot distinguish between good advice, like beware of leopards, and nonsense, uh, like religion. And so what you, what you would predict from that is that in every part of the world, uh, children would be being brought up with good sound advice by their parents and tribal elders, but at the same time, they would be filtering down through the generations a whole lot of nonsense, 
which simply passes on because it passes on because it passes on. Uh, once it gets into the cycle of passing from generation to generation, each new generation feels an obligation to pass it on to the next generation. And that's why you get religions all over the world. They all believe something different, they, but they all believe what their grandparents told them, what their parents told them. And so it's sort of like a computer virus. It's like a, it's a, a religion is a kind of computer virus which is parasitic on the good impulse. Like co computers are built to do good things like word processing and spreadsheets and things. So they're, in order to, to do that, they have to be built to obey what the programmer tells them to do. But they can't distinguish good advice like how to do a word processor from bad advice like computer viruses. Mm. And that's what I think religion is. It's, a, it's, a, it's equivalent of a computer virus. It's a virus of the mind. Mm. <coughs> <coughs> Let's see if we can get someone out front. Hi. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Astrid. I study chemistry. And I know in the liberal communities like Portland, we have a lot of atheist people, but we also have a lot of people who have non-scientific beliefs, such as anti-vaccination, anti-GMO, anti-water fluoridation. What do you guys do to combat that? Because there's plenty of combating the religious right and climate change. Well, once again, evidence and, and uh, the, the, you, sorry? You, 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 you have to look, at the, you have to look at, the, at, the, at the evidence and the evidence, whether it's evolution or vaccination, whatever it is. Um, and if the evidence is overwhelming, then that's what you should believe. If the evidence is not overwhelming, then you should suspend judgment and uh, look for more evidence. Yeah, and you have to teach people to value evidence. And that's Sam Harris's question. If someone doesn't value evidence, what evidence can you give them to help them value evidence? Well, they, they don't value evidence in the first place. So in a sense, I think it, teaching people to value the right things is important. Uh, let's get somebody down in the front one more time. Someone down in the front. Where that, are we? That Hi. lady there, maybe. <coughs> we got someone. Do, we have a, someone with a microphone. Then we'll bring it up here later. Hi. Uh, I just wanted to um, say that I appreciate the approach that you're taking now, uh, based on the movement of gay rights in the last thirty years. Do you have a question? I, wanna, I do. Question. I want to know what your opinion is on the um, role of a more militant approach to atheism um, based on the fact that the gay rights movement was started by what, more militant. What do you, more militant. you know, I never know what people mean by that. By militant. Well, what do you mean by militant atheism? I mean more than just coming out. I mean being in your face. That the, the idea that ignorance used to be a source of shame and now it's something that is spattered off in the U.S. Supreme yeah. Court. I, I don't think that the gay movement ever used violence. I mean, they, they, they always just used... used no, violence. I don't mean violence. I mean no. militancy. I mean being in your face, not just coming out. Yes. I mean, this possibly might be a place where Peter and I might slightly disagree because he's an expert persuader, actually written a book about persuasion, of, of how, to, how to, 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 to turn people to be, to be atheist. And I'm not very good at that. I mean, I... I um, <laughs> I, I just been, um, I've just been trying out Peter's app, and I got the wrong answer to just about everything. Uh, 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 I kept on being re rebuked as for being too confrontational. <laughs> but I hope I'm confrontational in a polite way, um, uh, never using obscene or violent language. Um, and I think there may be room for both ways of doing it. Uh, I don't feel particularly inclined to be, to bend too far over backwards um, to accommodate the person that I'm talking to. Um, quite often, I suppose, what I'm doing is talking to them with an audience. Sometimes if, say, I'm on, I don't know, a radio chat show or something, and I'm talking to some ignorant fool, <laughs> uh, uh, and I probably will give up the opportunity to actually convert him, mm. but I'm uh, mindful of the fact that there are a couple of thousand people listening in on the, on the radio. And so 
I might not actually shrink from confronting him because I might hope that I would do some good for the people listening in who maybe haven't actually thought about it very much, maybe sitting on the fence, uh, maybe scarcely aware there was a fence to sit on. Um, so I think there's something to be said for uh, being a little bit confrontation confrontational. Um, and But I think there's also something to be said for Peter's approach as well. Yeah. Thanks. Let's see if we can get someone right up in the front here. So, and then we're going to go up to <coughs> level three. Who's got the mic? Um, given that we have. So oh, we in the front. Can you turn the mic on up front? So right now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the two of your books, The Selfish Gene and The Greatest Show on Earth, inspired me to think about life in a new and different way. Given that we Can you have talk a bit more slowly. Absolutely, yeah. sorry. Um, given that we have so much in common uh, with other species, um, our cousins, primates, chickens, pigs, um, cows, do you think you're ethically justified in using them for our own personal pleasure and benefit, uh, like animal testing for food, for clothing, for entertainment? Um, and if you think that we are not, do you think that this is an important statement to make as skeptics, as free thinkers, as humanists? I know you talked about this with Peter Singer a bit um, in your interview with him, yeah. so please. Um, that would be great. I, I'm not sure that, that actually closeness of cousinship to us is the only thing that, that matters. Um, Jeremy Bentham said something like, the question is not, can they think, can they reason, but can they suffer? Mm. And I don't think there's any particular reason to think that the capacity to suffer is related to how closely related they are to us. Uh, some of the most distantly related animals from us might well be able to suffer. Um, nor is there any reason to think that, we're, we're, and, and by the way, some of the most distantly related uh, people, I mean, animals, might also be very good at thinking and reasoning. Um, like dolphins say. Um, I don't think there's any reason to suppose that the capacity to suffer is correlated positively with the capacity to think and reason. So uh, we are apt to feel the greatest moral compunction where species that can not only are close cousins of ours but also can think and reason. But when you, when you think about what pain is about, what pa what's pain for? Why did natural selection build into animals the capacity to feel pain? What pain is, is a warning. It's a statement made by the nervous system, don't do that again. Uh, if you do something which causes you pain, then the feeling of pain tells you not to do it again. It's always been a bit of a mystery to me why it has to be so damn painful. Um, you might think that the equivalent of sort of raising a little red flag in the brain would be enough, but it looks as though it's not enough. It looks as though it really does have to be painful. And if you're a species that isn't very good at thinking and reasoning, and you need a lesson in not doing that again, Mightn't you need actually more pain in order to avoid doing it again? Could it be that there's even a negative correlation between the capacity to think um, and the capacity to feel pain? Could it even be that animals that are species that are not very bright actually can feel more pain than those animals that are, well, indeed, the, 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 than, than us? Uh, probably what we do have, which other species don't have, is things like the ability to mourn our dead, to fear uh, the future, because we can imagine the future better. Um, but, but strictly where, where, where pain is concerned, I think we may need to rethink our moral philosophy, rather, in the light of Darwinian evolution. <laughs> Let's go up to level three. Thank you. Um, so, uh, what advice would you have for the 
<coughs> for those that are still in school, whether it be college or high, high school, uh, for the um, non-believers in high school that have to deal with uh, the teachings <laughs> um, that are, um, sorry, what advice would you have for the non-believers that still attend a school even though that school does not uh, foster the ability to think freely? Damn, I hate the advice question. <laughs> um, um, I don't know. I mean, what, who, who am I to, to tell you what, what advice? Um, uh, I've, I've got no great store of wisdom or anything like that. I think just, just value... Value evidence, as Peter said earl earlier, it's, it's actually not that, that easy to persuade some people that evidence is even worth valuing. But try to persuade people that, that evidence is important. Try to persuade people that the truth is not only useful, but wonderful, mm. uh, glorious. Mm. And um, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, and that, that's one of the things that religion takes away, is that sense of wonder. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they would deny that, but, uh, but, but, but yes, I think they do. Yeah. All right, let's go to level two. Hello, level two. Um, the concept of beauty is often attributed to being unfathomable. With a scientific mindset, how do you define beauty? Beauty is something which may be very, very difficult to define scientifically, and it may be that we're not ready to even attempt to define it scientifically. But having admitted that, it's very different from admitting that it has no scientific explanation. Uh, so I think there's a big difference between what you can actually, in practice, explain scientifically and what you believe in principle is explicable scientifically. So I think it's, it's right and proper that universities should have people uh, teaching, studying poetry and music and art in a non-scientific way uh, while at the same time never denying that there is ultimately a scientific explanation for our perception of, of beauty. But it's, a, it's, 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 it's the, a waste of time trying to explain um, w why Beethoven is beautiful uh, in purely scientific terms. You won't, you won't succeed but you can believe passionately that it's ultimately explicable. Uh, let's see if we can go down level two. Hi, uh, long time listener, first time caller. <laughs> <laughs> I was curious if you think that there's a biological correlation to men virtually across all cultures committing suicide more than women. To be what more than women? Do, do men, is, it, is there a... Do men commit, is that an, are you stating that as an empirical fact? Is that a fact about reality that men are more likely to commit suicide independent of culture? The, uh, it seems to be over most cultures that that's what happens, I mean, you, from well, what I've read. I've never heard of that. No, I, 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 it, it, if that's true, it's interesting. I would, I would like to look into it. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I would like to know what evidence one has for that. All right, let's go to... Uh, Let's, let's, let's go to, where haven't we gone yet? Let's go, let's see. Let, let's, let's see, hide these people up there on level three. Let's go to some very eager, enthusiastic people on level three and to the side up there. Hello? And it, this is, you've been great about Hello? stating your question, so thank you. I'm over here. Hi, Dr. Oh. Peek Pagosian. I actually took your class a few, uh, many years ago, and it was very, very enlightening. Um, I worked, uh, I work in developing countries, specifically in Rwanda, and I've encountered many, many religious um, Africans. I myself am an atheist, but they ask me time and time again, how can I forsake my religion when hope was the only thing? It gave me the hope to keep going. Um, while I've convinced or talked to plenty of religious people here, that note struck so difficult for me how do you, how do you, can you please comment on the idea of hope with respect to religion and why they're so nested together? Well, uh, yes, it, I'm quite often 
accused in the following sort of terms. It's all very well for you, uh, who live in a nice house in Oxford and are reasonably well educated to, to, be, to be an atheist, but there are people in the world who are starving and poverty stricken, mm -hmm. and uh, the, the sort of hope that they have, perhaps for the next life, is the only thing that keeps them going. But no, you have to sympathize with that. Uh, it doesn't make it any more true, of course, uh, and I'm afraid my commitment to truth is, is too passionate uh, to let that kind of consideration outweigh the yeah. love of truth, but I, but I, I must say, say I do sympathize. Isn't there, I think there's another problem with that too though, to have hope in something, there has to be a possibility, a, a realistic possibility that, that the object of your hope is manifest. Apparently not, and because I mean, uh, uh, <laughs> but I mean, if the if the if the hope that's offered is a promise of something after death, uh, that's unverifiable, and and so yeah, I don't. So maybe it's a semantic game, but I wouldn't use the word hope for that. I I would. Say uh, it's something else. It's some kind of delusion or something. It's well, not, it's delusional, but 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 it's still hope. I mean, you can you can hope for something unreal. But you can't, I, I hope, would, you can't specify, hope for a round square. I would specify that the people in question were not talking about hope of, of the afterlife. They were talking about the hope of a meal or the hope of education. Well, and in, in, in that case, it's ironic that yeah, that's yeah. through it probably the religion is unrealistic that in that case because, because religion yeah. is, is no, but not particularly likely to get you a meal. I mean, the sound agricultural practice is more likely yeah. to, to yeah, do you, that. You can't hope. I mean, I suppose you could hope to find a job and you could pray about finding a job, but it would be like uh, the governor of Texas who now wants to run for president as a Republican goes out when there's a drought and he brings people and they pray for rain. Yes. <laughs> well, you know, um, General Patton in the Second World War is said to have one of, his, one of his battles. It was vitally necessary that the weather should be just... So he called in the chaplain and said, chaplain, we need help. Can you pray for rain? Or, what, or, or the opposite, I forget whether it was. Chap the chaplain very correctly refused. Right. Yeah. right. Uh, let's go somewhere down here. Oh, oh down here. The microphone on. Uh, I got a question on maybe science has a faith-based faith aspect. Uh, we have science as, as far as we can visualize in the universe, we have faith that the laws of science are all in the universe, they're the same. That's, we can't prove that. And also the faith... Is that, is that a, which, so what's the question? The question is, is there, do we use faith in science also? In the term of eternity, we have faith that there's something out there, but we can't physically prove it. The same as in religion, they have faith in something which is not... I think, it's, I think it's false to say that we, to, to use, I mean, people do use the word faith for, for science, but I think it's a very different thing. Um, f you, faith means belief without evidence. Faith in science is amply uh, verified, amply supported by history. Science works uh, over and over again. Just about everything, indeed everything we know about the real world has come about through science and it works. And if you, if you follow the precepts of science, you, you, you can fly, you can get to the moon, uh, you can cure uh, smallpox, um, or you can vaccinate against, against smallpox. Um, science works. And so uh, faith based upon evidence is not faith at all. It's just, it's just sound common sense. I, I've always had a problem with that usage of the word faith, it, even, even if you say that faith has a, a wider or broader semantic range, I think that people use that term primarily with a religious impetus to make, look, I have faith in whatever I have faith in, you have faith in science, as if there's some kind of a parity there. There is no parity there. I think it's a misapplication of the word that's meant to extend beyond, you know, a belief beyond the warrant of the evidence. And there's overwhelming warrant. I mean, things fall down. You don't need faith in that. That's, that's called gravity. All right, let's get somebody on the second floor up here. 
Last, well, last, ooh, last it's question. Qu it's quick, I promise. This is, it's a quick one. Um, back here. Uh, in his seemingly infinite wisdom, uh, uh, the, the Honorable Deepak Chopra has recently come out uh, <laughs> describing you as, and this pains me to say this in front of so many of our loved ones here, intellectually challenged. And I'm wondering if there is any way I could persuade you to honor us with a response. A deepity. A deepity. A deepity. Uh, no, I don't, I'm not going to give publicity to Deepak Chopra. <laughs> Could I also, can I, since that was, was the last question, um, we're, we're going to have a book signing, and I wonder if I could ask your indulgence, maybe even forgiveness. Um, we've got a rather large audience here, and um, we're hoping to sell a rather lot of books, and so it, it, experience shows that the, the signing line can be very long, and so out of um, consideration for the people who end up at the end of the line, I wonder whether you'd mind if I decline to personalize my signature uh, and also decline to, uh, to pose for selfies. 